he worked for Moody's, um, which had acquired a business he had started for some time. And now he works in the governance and assurance fields and is a partner in Corporate Governance Pro with activist shareholder Theo Buota. We also have Pete LaRue, of, who's the head of the Solidarity Research Institute. The Solidarity Research Institute is the research arm of Trade Union Solidarity and conducts analysis on labor markets and other issues. Um, he's an economist uh, with an honors degree from, in economics from the University of Stellenbosch. So we'll start with the inquiry. Um, we think we know what's going on with an in, at ESCOM. So is this an inquiry into, to use Donald Rumfeld's terms, no knowns? We know what we know and we know what the problem is. But here we are with an inquiry. What would you like to see um, in terms of the terms of this, uh, the terms of reference of this inquiry, Shal? I'd certainly like it to be. Of the process to ensure that it's independent and um, is not um, swayed by his interests. Well, believe you me, if the right quality of people do this inquiry and present that board with a report, I can almost guarantee you that the government will be getting a copy as well. So that's the way to handle it. But you need people who really understand the extent of the problem. People, again, themselves with the ability to be really brutally frank as to what they find. And of course, people with the kind of experience to say, in a situation like this, we can make some suggestions as to improvement. Not necessarily. We will find some, uh, if you wish, some rats in the grass or s snakes in the grass that, uh, that is behind this, uh, this decision. Okay. Because, yeah, otherwise it would seem to perhaps maybe confirm what, what is already known. So, uh, but, but there could be surprises. But I, I could add, and I think Charles has, has um, put his finger right onto the problem, and that has to do with the relationship between the so-called shareholder and the company. Uh, and it isn't what you generally understand under the term, if you think of a shareholder, it's generally a private relationship, but this is a state relationship. We're very- The way of the last 150 years is you go in there, you smash some eggs and you fix it. Now that has typically happened because people say, this company is going bankrupt. It gets taken over by somebody else who can actually make it work. And the result is at least in more than 50% of cases positive. So, Whilst we may not think that in an ideal situation with an ESCOM running well, that is a good solution. It might be that in the crisis we sit in now, it has to be the only solution. Because, and, and this is just my uh, personal perspective, you will never find anybody who can take over the whole ESCOM or wants to take it over. And there are many reasons, some of them are actually even accounting reasons, because of the way that they've valued their plant and not written it down to what the theoretical value should have been. Nobody will take over the whole ESCOM like we have it here. And I mean by nobody, I mean that if you go to 15,000 shareholders, they would not be interested in doing that. But you might find that in the interests of stability in the country, either a combination of government and private uh, sector can say, right, we will take over Madupi and Kusile. And we will, within a matter of, say, 15, 20 months, make this thing work or we will face an incredibly high penalty. Um, similarly with some of the cases where the quality of maintenance has been abysmal. Perhaps this is a case to say one power station is then put in another entity's hands which can actually make a difference. And interestingly enough there are technical um, organizations in the electricity field that make this their business. They normally do it for you. In other words, you come in and say, look, turbine XYZ is not working well, and they'll come in and fix it, obviously charge you for that. But they do exist around the world. And some of them are very large organizations indeed. And it is therefore not a theoretical suggestion. But to take over the whole ESCOM and think that by some kind of a magic wand you've solved the problem, sorry, no way. Mm -hmm. No way in five years, and in my very simplistic way of view, no way in 10 years. We don't have 10 years. No. Yeah. Just on that, Trudy, in fact, we've had a couple of people on social media as well who've said that, you know, 
privatization isn't a panacea. You know, it's not a silver bullet. Mm. It's not going to solve everything. And that whatever the approach is to kind of solve the problems of ESCOM or tackle load shedding and the pressure on the grid needs to be kind of multidisciplinary. Some people even saying, for example, we need to look at more natural resources, natural energy sources like solar, for example, wind, that kind of thing. But it certainly touches on what you've said about, you know, it, there is no quick fix. There's mm. no one solution to the problem. Mm. And I mean, I suppose, you know, as I was saying, maybe reflect on the timing issue as to do you really sell an asset when it's at its worst, um, when you're basically going to have to give it away um, on some senses? Um, or do you try to work within a state-owned model but try to reform it? Well, I think I, I sort of agree with Charles again on this one that it's uh, we don't have to think. How we, it's no use thinking of privatizing the whole of ESCOM, transferring it to some new monopoly. We'll just be reporting to a private shareholder. Uh, very often that's the sort of privatization you get mm. when huge conglomerates, uh, you, you privatize uh, a huge state-owned enterprise or utility and then you get a, a specific uh, um, uh, new monopoly, but it's just uh, in, in private hands, so-called, but it's still a government-granted monopoly. Well, uh, if, if that's, the f uh, that's not for government to decide. It's not for them to decide if a private producer can make profit or not by selling electricity at a good price, uh, running his, uh, risking his own money. Allow them. If they, make a f uh, if they make a mistake, they'll pay the price, but it, no one else will pay the price. So th there's no downside to allowing private producers to uh, come online either on their own or uh, in, a, uh, in an environment where they can wheel over ESCOM's network, even, if, uh, yeah, even then. Even then. And I think it's another point here that we must exaggerate. And so I'm going to use the next okay. word very cautiously, uh, cautiously. When you're in a war situation, there's a thing called martial law that gets proclaimed. Mm. Now, please understand, I'm, I'm a pacifist. But the point is that for a specific reason, you say we are drawing a line through certain of our legislation, and hopefully it's a temporary thing. Now, you could disagree with me, but if we are going to have load shedding of a significant element, for five years still, and if a lot of that is going to be in winter this year, I don't know how far that is from a war just in this small respect. And therefore, I'm not convinced that one shouldn't make extraordinary regulations or rules or legislation for just this purpose. And they, we do have a war room in what Mr. Ramaphosa heads up to. So. Yeah, they called it that, but I'm not sure whether it was official. <laughs> um, I don't want to, as I said, I don't want to um, exaggerate the point. I'm just saying that there are situations where you decide that the situation is so dire that you almost forego your long-term political ideals and maybe your huge developmental ideas. I don't suggest doing away with them. I'm just saying in a crisis mode, crisis the water mode. goes okay. to the part of the family that needs it the most. Okay, so the idea that we're in crisis mode, there's been a lot of debate about that word, but I think we can safely say we are in crisis mode and that we should be thinking about doing things um, differently. We're going to have a quick break where we'll uh, keep the conversation going um, on social media. And after the break, we'll start talking about issues around coal, around maintenance and how um, these have contributed to the problem on. We're already paying all the taxes. We're already making sure that we make sure that we keep up with the uh, rates cuts or rates uh, payments that are required. So for the fact that we've been, this has been taken away from us, it must feel like uh, some sort of in injustice because we're not getting what we are paying for. And therefore, that's why you find that the situations that this create a big Is problem. In simple terms, as most of us know, that electricity is generated in power stations. We build most of our power stations to last for 50 years. If power stations were perfect and never encountered problems and could stay on all day, every day, for 50 years, we would not have a problem in South Africa. Until new power stations come online, we have what we have. We have aging power stations, uh, under-maintained, as a result, unreliable, and we, we need to make the most of it, keep the lights uh, burning as best we can. 
So we ended um, the last segment on the word crisis. Um, and um, a few people have a, a lot to say on that on social media, Erin. Yes. If we go back to when uh, Tsotsi announced the recalling of the four ex or the sort of, you know, um, the disciplinary kind of inquiry and the fact that these uh, four executives from ESCOM were going to be put to, so to, to one side while they investigated what was going on, he said there isn't a problem. There's nothing nefarious going on here. It's to ensure there isn't a conflict of interest. And when that happened, social media, Twitter in particular, really got a, a, a strong response from, from everyday South Africans, public people, who, who felt that ESCOM is in a crisis. It's evident from the load shedding, the load shedding we've had since late last year. Total liberalization that, that can uh, be done. We'll get to um, a bit more on uh, competition and, and why that seems to, to not be happening um, as vigorously or as quickly as it should. But I mean, uh, take us into ESCOM because um, Solidarity has written quite extensively about coal maintenance. What is your reading um, of where those issues are at the moment? Well, we, re we revealed last year um, serious maintenance problems at Mayuba. Uh, initially, our allegations were denied by ESCOM and uh, in the end we, prove, we proved 1,000 white staff left ESCOM. And we know f as a practical fact of history that most of the experience and skills at at that stage would have been captured in the white employees. As new employees came in uh, between uh, 2004 and last year, and about 15,000 more black employees entered ESCOM um, and no more white employees. So the white employee level stayed the same, which is not a problem in itself in any specific case we can say. But what we do know, what we do know from that is this very direct uh, intervention from government side that prioritizes race over the delivery of electricity. So instead of you, you're okay. saying they might no, do that. No, but that would be a summary of what I'm hearing, that, you know, well, we uh, know from the transformation. Trudy, you, you would agree with me that the, and, and this is not, but I'm saying this is the Commission for Employment Equity with this, this is a, this is a very general statement I'm making, that the, um, the fact is that due to educational, uh, due to history, um, history brings us to a position where there is a larger pool of experience and skills under white people than under black people. This is part of the reason why government has large education drives and affirmative action is to rectify a lot of that. The very fact that transformation doesn't occur in the absence of someone saying you have to have these targets, whether it means um, increasing the proportion of black people and keeping the same number of white people, I suppose that's the debate that, that, that you want to have. But it doesn't, co it doesn't no, necessarily I come through when solidarity talks about race. It becomes well, I can give you the an numbers. either or. I can give you the numbers. So you said, you, I, I uh, agree with you, it shouldn't be an either or. Um, but this is what ESCOM is doing. So ESCOM um, is taking in its affirmative action plan right now. It was released in December. It says we have 3,400 white employees too many. What you're suggesting seems much um, good. It says maybe we can just increase who are unfairly dismissed? Do you uh, speak vocally uh, in, in those instances? Or is it always about instances where it's an issue that can be linked to affirmative action? We have in many cases, uh, and specifically in ESCOM, Mr. Engelbrecht, we represented, who was a colored employee, but he was said he was not in line with the, uh, ESCOM's black targets. We represented him. We have uh, various court cases which involves not only white employees. This is um, no, but th this is all out there. It, it's it's easy to Google. No, no, but it's the same. It's it's, it's still about challenging uh, employment practices that arouse out of arise out of alleged affirmative action. A case where there is a black employee you are representing, which it has nothing to do with. I mean, you're a union. It has to do with insubordination or, you know, something. Sure. Anybody can join and we represent many people. I can't, you know, for confidentiality purposes, I can't. Black members? You have. Of course, but this is, this is um, of course we have. Um, but this is public knowledge. It's really, uh, I can say it on, it's, it's, it's easy it's to ascertain. It's not, um, it's not, we never pretend to be anything else. You never present to be anything else but? It's, uh, you, you're saying, do we have black members no, no, as no, if I'm we would also not have black okay, members? No, of course. That, all I'm saying is that in terms of the issues you take up prominently, it's never about a random black worker who's been um, disciplined for insubordination or an issue that no. is plain vanilla labor issue involving a black person. It's always white colored with an affirmative action context to it. Well, certainly, affirmative action is a very important topic for solidarity, and we will concentrate and we keep concentrating on it because it, we think it is very detrimental to the end product, which is service delivery. 
delivering electricity, delivering postal services, delivering telecommunications, uh, and it's very detrimental. So very like engineers, accountants, trained, whatever, who still come up against certain barriers that have nothing to do with their... But that's not right. ...with I mean, their historical or whatever. That, that has to do more with institutions that seem to be resistant and, and, transformation. And, and that one can never say is in order in terms of sound corporate governance, which is my field. Never is that in order. I'm talking about an ESCOM that seemingly has too few engineering people, and remember they don't all have to be qualified engineers, they have to be in that field, the skill, yeah. they have to understand that you can see a line, it's carrying electricity, you don't go <laughs> near it and it's <laughs> switched off, etc. Who seem to be able to say and bang their fists on the table, what we're doing is not right, this company will fail. Okay. Because we talked about this aspect of the crisis, the diagnosis of the fact that we are going around a, down a wrong path does start at the technical level where somebody says, this silo is vibrating. Hmm. Aaron? Well, I wanted to say on, on the issue of kind of labor and transformation and the demographics of the workforce, that hasn't really come up in the social media responses we've had t today on, on the ENCA Live hashtag. They tend to have focused on ESCOM as a public service provider, as a utility for the people, on the issue of performance. Um, there, ha there has been mention of Lynn Brown, of bonuses, and of the issue of load shedding, but really the kind of the, the issue issue of transformation, the demographics of ESCOM employees, that's, that's not something that's really coming from the hashtag ENCA Live audience on social media. And it, it seems to be more a kind of um, pedestrian sort of um, understanding of ESCOM and where it fits in and why why load shedding and the, the power utility problems are, are, are an issue. Mm -hmm. So this conversation is taking it in, a, in an area that social media isn't really kind of occupying at present you know they're focusing on my lights don't work ah oh, my phone battery is dying and you know I don't know when we're gonna get power again so so the solidarity kind of transformation debate is, is a little out of sync with 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 where things well, sit I mean as in terms the of the, the hashtag in terms of the hashtag <laughs> let's put it that Look, way so we do have an inquiry that will go into the the, the, um, the details I suppose and perhaps mm. um, you might be vindicated my doubt will only be that the way the debate is already framed um, is probably not going to come out to say um, that this is an institution that doesn't value skills in, in, in the way you put it. It's more that it's pursuing this hard transformation target, but also trying to deliver. And you say the approach is nuanced, fine. But I suppose out there, what you're seeing is people who are saying, my lights are just not on. What's, mm. what's going on? I'd like to make a prediction from a mm. complete situation of no knowledge that what's going to come out from the um, investigation will be that there are people in... Um, in all of the major, be it in the security cluster, be it SAA, be it, uh, you know, there's SABC, suspensions, allegations, counter-allegations, espionage, you know, how do we, how does a nation get to such a governance crisis? Well, my field is the board. Mm. Uh, at the time of a certain gentleman from America who got a lot of money from SAA, Mm. that many of us feel he might not have been entitled to. The board was constituted in a certain way. He was the only executive on the board. This is Coleman Andrews, right? No? It would be Coleman yes. Andrews, yes. <laughs> he was the only executive on that board. Now, that's not mm. a good idea. There needs to be at least two and possibly three. So that, and I'm guessing now, Mr. Coleman Andrews says, look, it's no problem. We'll buy from Boeing and our problems will be sorted out. Mr. Andre Fulun will sit there and say, ooh. And if somebody asks him, do you agree, Mr. Mm -hmm. Fulun? Now has a choice. He either s says what he really believes or he says, well, this is my boss. I'll speak to his uh, agenda. But the ability to actually take a board, and maybe it's a madcap idea, maybe the remuneration of these exec executives should be linked to the number of load shedding days. <laughs> so we say, right, uh, you're going to be paid, yeah. Mr. Matona, in this case, you're going to be paid your uh, XYZ million, but for every load shedding day that lasts for more than three or four hours, we're going to deduct 10% of your salary. Yeah. I have a feeling mm -hmm. that Mr. Matona will then suddenly use different words when describing the state that Eskim is in, because it's actually hitting him mm. in the pocket directly. 
And that's where it hits the people who are commenting on social media. Yeah. They're the people whose lights are going out. They're the people whose phone batteries are dying. You know, they're the people who, who can't switch on a radio or a TV if they don't have batteries plugged into them. And, and that's really, you know, what you see in the commentary. It's about the bonuses because that's what the consumer sees. Mm. They see a headline that says in 11 million, mm. you know, and they want to know, ah, but you know, does he have a generator? Has he forked oh, yes. out 10,000 yeah. rand so that it mm. doesn't bother him? And it's all very well when ENCA for for example, will air a, an interview with an ESCOM CEO or an ESCOM kind of senior member who says, but I have a generator. Well, that's very nice that you have a generator. But someone on Twitter, like me, will say, you have a generator because you spent 10 So we must mm. remember, and I think this comes out in the press release by, uh, by the board, that Mr. Matona and the executives who have now been suspended isn't, uh, they cite a number of reasons like uh, costs and overruns and, and so on. But we must realize that they're not really, you can't blame an ESCOM executive after six months in yes, the chair no, for, yes. for everything. No, I'm not blaming any yeah. particular person. I'm giving an example the incentives. as to the fact yeah. when you have a job to do and the job is not being done, why should you be paid a cent? So you're saying the incentives should be aligned. Uh, and so perhaps those incentives should also have include maintenance days. Future. I think, first of all, all of us should stand together because we have to realize that we're in this together. And we should find a way, or should be helped to find a way, that we can help fix it. And if it means that I take the little 1,000 rand that I may have in my pocket and make it available to an entity that actually can produce electricity, be it an IPP or somebody else, then I must be able to say, or must be willing to say rather, I will sacrifice that. Thank you. And I think that the source of our problems are uh, twofold. One is centralization, increased government control. But sometimes we hit into glitches. But thank you for joining us. As I mentioned, you can catch the playback on YouTube and see you next Tuesday at 1.30. Good day.